number of you have already talked about your ideas going forward and what that might look like in order to sustain responses that have come out of this crisis. So, and we are talking to other, other boroughs, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So GCDA is 40 years old. We helped start cooperatives. Um, so GLL, Greenwich Leisure Limited, was started by GCDA. It was a way of saving the, the leisure centres in Greenwich. And now they run 400 leisure centres, 200 libraries and early years centres. And we also started um, credit unions and we also used to run a LEPS programme for a very long time, actually. Um, in Greenwich when I first started at GCDA and my role started um, around the creation of food co-ops so 20 years ago so we started fruit and vegetable uh, stalls on estates across Greenwich in order to support people to access more affordable healthy fruit and veg in food deserts where they didn't have access to affordable fruit and veg they weren't close to street markets or large supermarkets for example so it started with uh, a wholesale fruit and vegetable business which we still run um so we've it's gone through various different reincarnations coronations and and now it's stalls in early year settings and um schools and very much we just wholesale to those places so we're still a fruit and vegetable wholesaler um but but um we also because it was about addressing health inequality um, and household food insecurity, we looked at other things. So we supported the development of food growing projects and we supported over a hundred and we still support those and farms and organic food growing businesses. Also the creation of new food businesses, also um, tuck shops, school meals, various things. So, so now in Greenwich, we have our wholesale fruit and vegetable business. We have a fair share food distribution hub and we've distributed 60 tons of food since the middle of March. We also have a, a food surplus meal business called Plenty. And we've distributed 30,000 meals since the middle of March to 36 groups. And actually that was a, that's a commercial business um, that where we sell, we sell food that's uh, 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 on street markets that sometimes sell at seven or eight pounds if we're using, and we use local sustainable. Uh, food to when we use surplus we sell at one pound and it's the model we use for doing the holiday meal provision so we've been gca piloted holiday meal provision in greenwich six years ago as some small grants and we managed to get it commissioned by greenwich council so actually we do have the most expensive holiday meal provision and last year we did twelve thousand meals and so when um covid hit we had already meals for two thousand meals readily ready made using surplus all in our freezers ready to go for easter so they were the first meals where you're able to go out so we do the so we have our and now we've so so we start the projects but we managed to get those mainstreamed and commissioned so we're now doing holiday meals and we're doing combination tree pat lunches food for people to take home and some food that can be served currently and yeah and we use surplus for that so so to make it more affordable so we do holiday meals fruit and veg um, we also then set up our own food hub about 10 years ago, and that was to help incubate new ethical food businesses, but we use that for our food production. And, um, uh, but we also have a community centre in one of the areas of high deprivation in, in Woolwich, and that's where we've got our food hub. So, we, so that's where we distribute our food from. And um, we, GCDA was grant funded and the work we did around food was grant funded until about 10 years ago. Um, but we converted, we raised the money to build our hub, our kitchen and the hub. And it's interesting, someone was talking about the creation of a kitchen. And, and when we've been thinking about sustainable solutions and how to really sustain this work and, and the way that the Felix and the, all the projects came together to try and work through one hub in each borough is the role of a hub and the role of a center that can handle food process food distribute food teach people about food and how it can sustain itself so so that's the other thing i should say we also run contracts we run um about 75 five six week cookery clubs a year across greenwich and lewisham to about up to a thousand people and we also have adult learning contracts so we now run food business courses for adults nourishing nippers introducing solids so we won adult learning contracts in the borough. So we'll, what we've done is um, piloted projects and then um, with grant funding or with our own resources, and then we mainstream them either through funding them through our own social enterprise. 
So we're about 60% self-funding through our own social enterprise and the other 40% we get through winning public sector contracts. And sometimes that's meant that we've piloted things and we've persuaded local authorities to mainstream them because of benefit. So for example, holiday meal provision. And also because that's what's happening regionally. So holiday meal provision has got higher profile, kitchen socials, helped with the mayor's funds. And so, so, and those, so that's what we've done. But I think the hub in terms of our financial sustainability and what really changed how we could support people was getting those physical hubs. So first of all, we got our production kitchens in Greenwich, which we rented out to food businesses, but it could also be where we did our own food processing. And the building costs us about £3,000, £4,000 a month to run, but we generate five to £6,000 from the building. So it covers all our office costs. It means we have this full production kitchen, it means we can incubate businesses. And then a number of years later, we got Woolwich Common Community Centre because no one else was willing to run it. And I went to it originally because it had a kitchen. I was looking at actually all the empty shops. I really wanted to do a wholesale dry goods co-op, but I was looking at the empty shops in the region and in the area and found this massive kitchen in this community center. And our kitchen was always full and always being used. And I thought, yeah. And, and the council said, would you, well, would you like the kitchen? It's like, yeah. But they said, would you run the community center? We'd never run a community center. And it was only had 20% occupancy when we took it over, but now has 100% occupancy and we host a migrant hub um, and we and a whole programme now in response to that community. But what we found is we, we were for 30 years, just or 20 years, let me think, 25 years, just had an office and we were just a co-op advisory group. And what changed our, in terms of our financial sustainability was having those physical assets that then were physical assets to generate money for us and for us to deliver our own projects, but also physical assets that could incubate activities that other people wanted to put on that would also support that local community. And um, when we've been looking, we've been looking at the various models and the, the kind of transition for Greenwich, we have a trust or trust food um, banks that are really, really good um, and have been supporting uh, 120 people maybe a week because Greenwich Council actually were one of those boroughs that invested thousands and thousands of pounds into a household food delivery service so the, there wasn't lots of extra demand on the food bank but as we look at transition and what transition really means I think there are elements um, across a whole spectrum so our prior in terms of food aid and the London Food Board and Greenwich and GCDA we think um, increasing household income is the primary thing that we should all be fighting for and poverty, food poverty is the res result of poverty and nothing else and people shouldn't have to be making choices between heating or food, that is poverty and we need to do everything we can to fight against the injustice of poverty from um, better wages to maximising household income um, to lobbying um, to finding other ways to reduce household bills so we also run a solar energy uh, co-op and um, part of that is um, doing a lot of work to help people in, reduce their household bills around energy because we definitely see a choice between energy and food um, but um, then then the other then you know as we maximize income and try and increase wages we'll also be looking at pathways for people to get out of poverty and that will be training and volunteering and, and we know some of those are really long and we know some of those are more complex and we know a lot of people are in need because of very complex conditions that we won't be able to easily address so but but there are a variety of pathways but for the food stuff what we there will be the role of the food bank and what we definitely want to do now is have a far closer relationship we might be looking at whether we prefer ready meals that the food bank can start giving out as part of their packages or as part of their offer but for gcda for our for the work that we're doing is we'll continue to find financially sustainable um, ways of doing the work that we do. We do not want to rely on grant funding to maintain essential support to vulnerable people. So our wholesale fruit and vegetable business already pays for itself. And what we're now looking at is this ready meals that we do, because we think we can do them when we use surplus for 80 pence, less than 80 pence uh, for a meal, for an adult meal. So we're going to be looking at the market for that and how that and is that something that can be commissioned. But the other thing that I'm um, we there's been a lot of interest in Greenwich in the fair share pantry. 
and the fair share pantry seems to work very well in partnership with the social housing provider because a social housing provider has resources has a building and it has this um need to protect its rental income by doing everything it can to support its its uh, residents so it makes sense that it can invest in a pantry um and i've looked at the pantry model but for, for gta the pantry model is not right because it costs so much money and and so many resources to run and my other real concern going forward is what's going to happen to surplus with um because a lot of the surplus that was available to us at the beginning of um covid was the restaurant and the food business surplus there was a huge amount of surplus came from a, a food industry that had to shut down then we've had the food from fair share and felix which has been paid for by defra which will come to an end in the end of october and then what we have then is um in january a very uncertain future about the food supply into the uk and the cost of that supply but i was chairing the brexit no deal subgroup for the mayor and for the london resilience forum and we had real concerns of looking at 20 30 percent increase in prices so we we just think the immediate knock-on will be a huge reduction in surplus from every every area because food becomes more valuable and that's a good thing in some ways but it's it's not good if your model reply relies on surplus so the kind of models we're now looking at is what does a membership cooperative look like and it's quite complex where some members you pay you might pay according to your contribution so so rather than say well you're wealthy and you can you know pay more and this person hasn't got as much money and they pay less we want to do something that was had more equity and more was more empowering where maybe it was based on volunteer contribution or other other things i mean maybe it will be to do with income so we're looking at models around um, membership cooperatives where where we can try and provide affordable um uh food to people that's partly subsidized by other members of the cooperative so it's a model we're just trying to develop that we're also going to share with islington to see if it's something we can launch and we'll probably do something like a whole membership offer across the whole of greenwich and say who wants to be part of this we want to think about sustainable food we want to think about buying from local food growing projects we are going to look about uh, look at different membership who's interested in this and how do you want to be involved and we may find that is the more people with more resources that want to be the members but that the, the um, aim will be to how we can get more affordable sustainable food to people on lower incomes so sorry that's just hope that's not i feel like i've just gone there um no that's, that's been, just a picture of where we are at the moment yeah and what we're looking that's at been, that's been really good thank you claire and i should also have said that if i drop out donna will dive in um and which is a, which does happen from time to time but that was really good claire thanks for that overview and you touched on some real issues that i i know will have um struck a chord with a lot of people here um what i'd like to do if possible is keep the questions to the end um and hopefully you you'll be able to stay on um so if we could do that and then go straight to alicia so alicia over, over to you um and then we'll hear from farah after you okay thank you so much so as i mentioned the first kind of role that i'm here representing is for the co-op who've recently launched this member pioneer kind of network so they've placed people into every kind of local community to try to make connections with other local community groups, organizations, and kind of look at ways in which as a business, we're able to help those local groups and kind of increase community engagement, things like that. So I won't go into too much detail here, but if there's groups which are interested in things like funding opportunities, that's something I might be able to elaborate a little bit more about. We've got opportunities throughout the year to apply for up to a thousand pounds, which isn't enough to sustain maybe a whole project, but can be quite a big contribution if there's something which just needs a little bit extra help. And the other thing is that all of the food stores we have um, are part of a program called Food Share. So basically, surplus food collection is available. And I get the impression that although this is something which is kind of available in all the stores, I think at the moment it's not quite being utilised fully. I think there's still a lot of opportunities for other organisations which haven't made contact to get in touch with local food stores. 
And again, that's something I can kind of help to provide contact details and kind of the online application form, any extra information if that's something people are interested in. And then to move on, um, as I mentioned, I've been doing a research piece for my master's around kind of impacts of coronavirus on charitable food distribution. So I've done over 20 interviews with organisations kind of throughout the UK, so Scotland through to Dover, and um, also looked at additional reports and documents just to kind of try and figure out, I guess, what the main impacts and the main challenges have been. So from that data, the main things I've seen so far in terms of the impacts, which I guess there aren't too many surprises about, obviously a lot of organisations have had to drastically change their activity models, so move to kind of delivery models, but this is something which isn't likely to be sustainable in the long term. And there's a bit of a worry about what's going to happen to people who are still kind of for health reasons or whatever else, unable to leave their houses kind of after lockdown officially finishes, but those kind of delivery models are no longer available as widely as they used to be. There's also been obviously hugely increased demand and the vast majority of organisations are reporting that that's coming from massive financial shocks to people and that they're seeing large numbers of people accessing free food support who've never kind of, who've never formed those typical groups of people needing support. And that's something that's not going to go away anytime soon. Next, although a lot of organisations have seen increased volunteer numbers during lockdown when people had a lot of spare time, there's also some worry about a potential volunteer shortfall when more and more people start going back to work. But those older volunteers who are perhaps shielding might again still not be able to step in. And that's something that's worth bearing in mind. Um, and then I guess on a more positive side, actually a really large number of um, organisations said that because of coronavirus, they've been collaborating so much more with other organisations, with councils, with fair share, with kind of mutual aid groups. And they found those relationships really positive and really beneficial. So actually a number of them have said that they're expecting some kinds of longer term benefits um, from the lockdown period in terms of kind of improved relationships, you know, a greater visibility of food issues, things like that. It seems like there's currently a lot more attention on the issue than there has been kind of at any point in the past. And it's a really good time to kind of capitalize on that and try to push through some solutions and make sure that we are moving towards kind of more sustainable options for the future. So as I mentioned, in terms of key challenges, it's things around a shortfall of volunteers, volunteer fatigue, I guess kind of logistical problems, and then food supply and health and safety are things which there is still kind of worry about going forwards. So how do we make sure that as we move all of these kind of what used to be delivery models into, I guess, collection based or cooperative or pantries or anything like that? How do we ensure that we're still compliant with all of the necessary building regulations, you know, track and trace, collecting people's contact details? Because there's a lot of kind of just coronavirus health and safety concerns which need to be taken into account at this time. So as kind of closing reflections from that, um, I think on the positive side, there's kind of a need to make sure that the benefits which we have seen for organizations during coronavirus, so you know, maybe more of a willingness to volunteer and fundraise and collaborate is something that we shouldn't kind of overlook going forwards. And we should look at ways of making sure that we maintain those relationships and that momentum far into the future. Um, but there's definitely kind of a couple of worries around the resilience of charitable food distribution going forwards. So we know that the demand is not going to go down anytime soon. And if anything, it's likely to get worse with, you know, furloughs ending and more and more people finding themselves struggling financially, not to mention what might happen when Brexit comes. 
So we need to look at ways of making sure that food provision in Camden is kind of resilient enough to be able to withstand this pressure and to make sure that we're really kind of building a system where we can access everyone who's needed. Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much for that, Alicia. That was really interesting. Um, and now our, our third speaker, Farah, over to you. Tell us what you've been doing with Life After Hummus. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we're, we're a community benefit society. That's our legal structure. Not many people are familiar with that, but it's part of the Cooperatives and Community Benefit Society Act of 2014. We're based in Summerstown, and what we did before COVID is we were providing hands-on nutrition and cooking classes to the local community and the wider community. So this is about how to get people eating more fruits and vegetables, tackling health inequalities, improving the health of the public. Now, the thing about us, we're BME-led, and um, after more than a year of carrying out our nutrition and cooking classes hands-on for the community you'd usually have 45 people per session attend um, we were very lucky we got funding twice from the north london waste authority to do this so our participation was about 45 people per session every monday for over a year we um, achieved at that point an over was it 40 seven percent bme engagement so for us that was like well if we're managing to do it why aren't other people managing to do it what are we doing that is so different when london has a makeup of 40 percent bme people why is it that we're managing to access these people where public health isn't managing where other organizations aren't now the outcomes for us um the top three outcomes for people was increased energy better digestion and weight loss um, in our sessions for the nutrition and cooking classes, we um, incorporated, we, um, we had a relationship with the Felix Project um, from before, so they would send us food surplus. Now, we only used a certain amount of that for the cooking classes. The rest we bought, um, and at the end of the sessions, we gave out whatever was left from that session if we couldn't hold things over for the following week. Now, um, what you find is that there's a problem you so as you start to do this you start to discover the issues around well wait a second if people are saying to you people aren't interested in cooking with fruits and vegetables how is it that for us it all disappears at the end of the session so there's this interesting thing when you start to look at well if it's free do people take it or is it that is it because it's free or is it because there is um there is food poverty I'm not making much sense there, but um, bear with me. So we um, then started to host our family sessions um, funded by the lovely people at Regent's Place for the local community only. And um, we were getting 20 to 30 families every session. Um, what made it special was that, again, um, the BME engagement was through the roof. Um, I think for the family sessions, 70 to 80 percent. And the little kids were coming in wearing no cut gloves and were cooking hands on. Again, we'd give out the food surplus and people would take it. One of the difference. Um, so there's a sort of a link between cooking classes and sustainable food provision. Um, one of the um, things that a parent came to me and said is they said to me like your um, your sessions are really good compared and please take no offense compared to the ones public um, health Camden and Islington were doing and um, they said to me in their own words theirs was rubbish I laughed and I said thank you very much for that it's very nice but I need you to explain to me what is it the difference why are we managing to engage you where they're not and um and they said because a lot of it was um theory based as opposed to practical and actually it's quite simple to do hands-on nutrition and cooking classes if you have a building that's willing to go along with you on the journey and if you have the right risk assessments in place it's not difficult to change any setting into a cooking setting um, which we do with mo movable equipment so for us we then set about um, working on a program because we tried several times to um, speak to public health camden and islington about taking this further 
and um, often for us it's we'll knock at the door and we can't get through so we say okay we'll go do something else and we'll come back so at our last conversation we said to them what we're going to do now is we're going to run a social prescription pilot for a year we're going to ask um, GPs in the area to refer people in the area to us for our hands-on nutrition and cooking classes and we're going to use an asset-based community development model the asset being the people who attend the other classes um, because what you find is that you create this atmosphere where it's an each one teach one as much as you're leading the session it's other people who are there helping um, the people now then covid hit and we were just about to launch this um, COVID hit, so we quickly adapted as a community benefit society to providing um, food parcels because we knew that there was going to be a problem. We went to shop for our last um, cooking session for the families and I said to my team, let's see what it looks like when I get to Booker's at Camley Street. Let's see. And um, I got there and the shelves were bare and Booker's were still signing up new people to join. And we just thought, thought wow, Summerstown is a food desert. Um, some people don't like to use that terminology, but it is um, because it doesn't have any affordable supermarkets in the area. And um, there's no sort of like real access to fruit and vegetables. Um, in the area as well at an affordable price. So quickly being a community benefit society, we were able to adapt our model and we started to provide food parcels. And I can tell you, we had to fight to make this happen. We had to fight with the managers of the building. We had to fight with sort of like a lot of people to get this off the ground. But we knew um, that there would be a demand and we knew that for us, it would be that we would get this BME engagement, we'd be helping the families most at risk, because if you know Summerstown, there are a lot of families who are reliant um, on gig economy. So Uber drivers, hospitality, um, catering staff, and we just knew that there was going to be big demand. So we actually got turned down for the first round of funding from Camden Given. I'm only mentioning this because grassroots have... Um, have issues getting things off the ground so what their feedback was um we didn't think you'd be able to pull off the oh we've lost i think we've lost you farah at the crucial moment farah are you can you Hi. Be Am I back. back? Yes. Yeah. So can you just me? finish off this? Yeah. Thanks. This okay. is a tricky, tricky one. You were, you were talking about the sort of strategic funding dilemma. So you, you put in a bid and you hadn't got anything. That's right. So grassroots have one of the biggest problems is that you say you can achieve somebody because you're on the ground, you know the community, but you may not have the track record. So the thing they said to us was that we didn't think you'd pull off the numbers you said. Now we actually smashed it. We actually sadly smashed it. We're supporting 280 people locally at the moment, just under half a children and um, predominantly Bengali and Somali, 70% BME engagement. Now for us, um, before COVID, we actually started planning a community fridge and larder project because we saw at the family sessions that Summerstown being a food desert area, there is a need for access to um access to food in that area um i agree very much with the other person that this is an income problem um this is food poverty if you can sort out the income it shouldn't need to exist um so for us what we look at is more i, I guess we're more grassroots so we look at the area itself so why is it that we're managing the engagement we're getting why is it what is it i don't know if that makes sense but so for us what we're looking to create is um we've been working on it from um the end of last year but it's now growing at first it was going to be a community fridge and larder space with a talking space the talking space was going to allow us to do social prescriptions and it was going to allow us to use the building where that would be based as a way to um, engage the hard to reach communities because we know we're already managing that. So now that COVID has hit, now that we're still providing um, food parcels and it's currently costing us 
a thousand a week in food supplies um, but this also is on top of surplus that we get from the Felix project um, we also get from who I call my fairy godmother Dorothea at Euston Food Bank she also sends stuff to us um, we also get surplus from Kentish Town Veg Box um, we get surplus from a lot of sources but it's still in order to keep people healthy it still costs us a thousand pounds a week 500 of which is spent on wholesale um, fruit and veg now in our food parcels because we track the weight so in our food parcels only a third to a quarter comes from food surplus you cannot feed people solely on food surplus it's for us it, it's a third to a quarter that's it the rest of it has to be purchased now we've had um the other day we had because we've slowly our parcels are, are delivered but we're slowly moving people to collections so even for collections we apply what we call an intersectional framework so for us we've provided we've started to provide trolleys to the families who need it as a form of empowerment so it can make it possible for them to come and collect their food parcels. One of the mothers came to the door, it's her first collection after um, say three months of receiving food parcels from us and she brought us this little card and um, to say thank you she threatened to bring chocolates and we said don't spend your money on chocolates and um, in this card she was saying thank you but she started talking to us and she was crying she said you kept us healthy during this time she's a Bengali mum and she said you kept us healthy in this time and you kept us smiling. Now when um, I won't take much longer, but when you look at sustainable food provision, the important thing to look at is how do you, how do you provide quality and how do you make sure that people aren't malnourished? Because if you rely on food surplus, there is an issue that um, people will become malnourished because of the quality of the food surplus. So for us, our forthcoming, and, and now I have um, the support of the local councillors, which is really great. Um, for us, it's going to be the opening of a um, asset-based community development driven community fridge and larder. So this space will be bringing in food surplus from the wider area. Um, because now we're signed up to Fair Share Go and we're signed up to Neighbourly. We couldn't get onto Fair Share because obviously of this DEFRA contract. We're two small players to get onto that. So we have to rely on what Camden give to us. And that hasn't worked very well, that system. Um, so for us, um, this will involve collecting from the wider area. We've been given some funding from RAP for surplus coordinator to bring that in. But the, um, the community fridge and larder will be membership based and it will be socially prescribed. So also what's very important is that this space, similar to other projects in Camden, does not turn up out to be middle class and white engagement. There's no other way of saying that. It's really important for us that it remains on, so that it would be socially prescribed, that families would have a prescription to come along. And when they'll become a member, and when they're there, we'll do similar to um, the project up in Leeds, a pay as you feel on the food surplus. The monies raised from the pay as you feel would allow us to purchase fruit and veg at wholesale price. So when they come in, what you would have is you'd have the courgettes there and it might say take three. You'd have the lettuce there, take one. So aubergines, take two. So what you'd find, because the food is free and it's pay as you feel, people would naturally be taking those fruits and vegetables. Then to go with it, this is um, about social prescription. So we're going to be using food as a vehicle, as we have for our food parcels, to link them up. So with our food parcels, what we did, working with Volunteer Action Camden, you guys have just been amazing, and the Welfare Rights Department at Camden Council, throughout our parcels we referred people for universal credit self-employed retention scheme how to lower their utility bills mental health support we've now moved into employability because we have such a close contact with our beneficiaries week after week we're asking them for the uber drivers where are you now they're saying 50 percent of earnings so i'm starting to say are you interested in looking at another form of employment they're saying yes so we're now referring them first to the job hub at the living center after speaking to julia thank you donna um and now we're um, also going to be referring them to the job hub at regents um 
uh, Regent's Park Ward as well, because they've got a great job hub there. So it's this idea, how are you going to get a local community like Somers Town back onto, it, onto its feet? Because at some point, the government is going to come after people who are on universal credit. At some point, you know, there is a risk that we go back to what I remember in the late 80s. So it's about using food as this vehicle. They come, they pay as you feel model, they also take the fruit and veg. And how do we sustain the project? We sustain the project on social prescriptions. That's what pays for the project, as well as tapping into funding around food surplus, redistributing this food surplus. Um, the other important thing I want to say when anybody's looking at sustainable food provision, you do have to look, you do have to look at ethnic food. So as much as it's great to think, yes, um, eat local, um, a lot of us are not from here. So for example, in the beginning, we looked at how could we provide them with um, food that was similar to what they would buy in the supermarkets they would go to. So we got long spinach. Then slowly we said, why don't you try this local cavolo now? Slowly, why don't you try this week? We've been doing spring greens. So that's the other important thing is to always just apply this intersectional framework when you're thinking about um, sustainable food provision. Um, and I think that covers everything. We, we think we're going to also bring back the cooking and nutrition classes back in July 2021. Um, at the moment, what we've also done just because of the food parcels, it's made it possible, we're organizing this summer school for the local kids. Um, because you, you, when again, this close contact allows you to understand what it is that people need. And one of the little projects that we're doing as part of the summer school, it's five activities every day, is um, a little uh, literature project um, called um, a BAME um, project called A Book Like Me. And again, that was just thanks to some books that we got from Regent's Place. I think that's it. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Farah, that's great. So Thanks, thanks so much to our three speakers, Claire Pritchard, Alicia Bourne, and Farah Rainfly. That was really interesting, and we're going to. I'm going to open it up to um, discussion now and questions. But um, I'd just like to say that was really fascinating and, and such a broad range um, of things. And um, yeah, the, uh, it, I was struck by this um, link between classes, classes and food supply, but also this the the basic issue of poverty and then the link to the the other things that can be done around around poverty uh, and the, the the importance of um the local aspect as well really seem to come through um but so many issues there about making this sustainable um and i guess the threats on the horizon as the sort of food surplus dwindles but the challenges of making it sustainable and and how we do that um, uh, and how that's been done in Greenwich was was fascinating to hear. So uh, I know an awful lot in there. Um, so let's open it up to to questions. Um, and um, any who any um, who would who is would like to go first? Actually, let me just first of all say welcome to Laura Murphy, who's just joined us from Unity Works. If you see a, an extra face on the screen. It's Laura. Um, so let me open that up to the floor. Um, Dorothea, is that, is that you? you I, I can see a hand waving. Are you wanting to say something? Uh, I'm just saying I'm really, many thanks to the speakers, and I'm really sorry I need to leave at 12, so I just put some stuff in the chat room thinking I would be leaving. Um, really what I wanted to say was uh, to the Greenwich, uh, about the Greenwich plan to distribute hot ready meals, that's worked extremely well for us. Many of the people who come to us are not referred and we can give them a few emergency items, but we also distribute probably around 250 hot meals per session that we get from Food for All. And I, I think that that is a very, a very um, powerful model that um, to use the food banks as a distribution point. Um, a food bank is meant to be 
emergency food while a person's crisis is resolved. So I'm intensely supportive of there being sustainable resolution as some sort of band-aid over the immediate need for food. But this is a poverty issue. It is an austerity economics issue. And I think it's really important that we all campaign for um, justice in our society so that distribution of food is not unequal in this way. And that's it. And really sorry, I need to go. Bye for now. Thanks, Dorothy. That that's a really important point there. Um, Sue, are you are you wanting to come in? No. Oh, sorry, I thought that was your hand. I've just I well, know um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean I think it's it is just about that whole issue. I wasn't gonna come in, I was waving goodbye to Dorothea, but oh. <laughs> Um, it, it, I was just thinking that, you know, everything about uh, everything being linked. So, for instance, you know, Sidings does uh, when we and we have reopened our nursery, but we uh, are we offer a lot of free childcare. In fact, the bulk, much of it is now free um, to and it is about um, we have offered the two year old voucher. Uh, for, sorry, two year old free places scheme. And it is about having that everything that's linked. So, for instance, and, the whole thing about local and in one building i think that um farrow was talking about that whole issue about linking stuff so we do have a kitchen and we have you know esol classes we have employability classes and so the parents that maybe come from the childcare then go into various classes if they want to um and we have had cookery in the past probably not now because of the social distancing but that that is something that it, that's certainly kind of featuring and that, i think it's about that concept of food being part of the of poverty because and and the uh, i really like the issue uh, the, the suggestions of giving out a range a, an optional range of food because if you're actually got to choose between you know keeping your electric on or you actually your you know your cooker's broken you know you can't cook maybe for a week or something like that if you're really really um, you know, so what do you do? So it's a bit like having your microwave work. So you can put a hot meal in the microwave or, you know, various things like that. So, and we were, we've actually have a local trust um, that gives out, um, we've been doing it for years, gives out sort of uh, free uh, things like pots and pans and kitchen goods and microwaves and kettles. So it is about that kind of linking in to a sort of holistic kind of provision um, obviously knowing your audience, I think that's another thing Farrow was saying is know your audience locally. So for instance, we, through the childcare and through our play and youth service, as well as computer classes, we do get a feel for who is really struggling. And like somebody else said, we were about to think about starting an emergency food pantry before lockdown. And we just didn't have the infrastructure to really take that forward until we've reopened. Um, so it's, it is just about seeing it in a much wider view. It is part of the poverty alleviation and linking it up. And that's why I was really interested just to hear about all the other models that were going on, because it's given me, it kind of reaffirmed that I think the infrastructure is there, but it's a bit like creating that infrastructure and linking into schools, because then you know who's got the free school meals and working locally with schools. I know there are some food banks do have partnerships with local schools. So it is about you know, looking carefully at how to how to build the best networks and the infrastructure as well that kind of so that it all feeds into, you know, if you are providing locally, you can still tap into maybe a wider infrastructure that feeds back locally. So it's about that two way partnership, maybe with the borough, uh, but, but going back into local, because I do think at the end of the day it is local, you know, your neighbourhood and people, people come and go and they're not always linked into the borough for various reasons. You know, they might be in private rental, private rental and really struggling, but not actually linked into any kind of housing association or council structure. So it is, and that's certainly the case around where we are. So uh, exorbitant rents, because that's another issue is housing. I don't even want to go there. Uh, so it, I, I just want to stress it's re been really useful. Thank you to all the speakers. But I think it's pointing to all this, you know, the whole linking up of everything. And the more you can find, I think, the physical assets, that's what... Um, was it Claire you were saying about having the physical assets and that, that there are those in Camden so it is about kind of looking at those and how to best make best use to them um, 
I think that's all. Considering I was just waving goodbye to Dorothea, I've probably said too much. Sorry. <laughs> no, thanks, Sue. No, that's, that's, there's, there's good points there. And I think that the, the joining up thing, I mean, and obviously that's, that's our interest and, and why we're here. So the joining up thing is important. And I think it's, you do realise there's a lot going on in Camden, but somehow joining it up and, and also joining it into the GLA level. Um, and um, I, I know that was partly um, uh, Effie and Piers at Public Health, there was the, the summit last week. I, I don't know if you want to say, um, Piers, I'll bring you in. And I was just going to say that before I bring you in, Piers, that um, Philip Vaughan is the council person. Now, he's not um, on, on the, the Zoom today, but I've just put in the chat, I put a link to his survey. So he's, um, he's the sort of link person into the borough. Uh, and is um, doing this this survey. So if you haven't done the survey already, do do that. And I presume, so Piers, um, tell us how how it's linking up with, with public health and etc. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, it's really great to be in this group and where, just as with the Food Poverty Alliance Summit that we had last week, to be able to understand more about what's going on on the ground. And also, Kevin, your point around linking things up. Um, more than one of the speakers there um, left me with three clear points. I mean, there are a range of others, but thinking clearly, as we've highlighted here today, the cash first side of things, the poverty alleviation, massive principal point. Um, that point that Dorothea highlighted, oh, she's still on the call, um, around promoting choice and dignity and the kind of moving away from food parcels and then into this um, uncertain future with a sustainable provision. And then thinking that third point that was raised around in the Alliance about clarity on roles and responsibilities locally. Um, communication is, is so essential. It's uh, so hard when you've, you know, you've got the job in front of you, but so many different links are being established and people are working more closely together. Um, it's great to hear from you, Claire, again, around the fantastic work you're doing in Greenwich and um, that you're exporting some into my other half responsibility in Islington. I think you, I know you've been talking to about that. And um, great to, to see you and hear from you, Farah. Um, I've seen a lot of correspondence with you. Um, clearly my colleagues, um, you know, you let us know about the um, ABCD stuff around the community pantry that you're developing. I think it's worth just clarifying in terms of the um, programs for uh, around the kind of healthy waste arena that have been running. Um, I just say to you, Farah, there's obviously room for several providers in that sphere. And the, the program that we've um, commissioned through the council, Families for Life and um, the Food Kitchen, um, they managed to hit 73% um, black Asian and minority ethnic community background so I know you know it's might sound like it, it's a, it's an impressive way just as far as you've got fantastic input around that proportion um, but people will gravitate towards different programs for different needs so um, it's, it's just great to be here and um, thank you Kevin I don't know if there's anything specifically were, were you you're at the food poverty lines weren't you Yes, I was. That, that was really interesting and I think um, uh, really, really powerful and really, really, uh, I think highlights that importance of bringing the all so many different agencies together. Unfortunately, Claire's just had to leave. She's seen, if you've seen it in the chat, she just had to go to another meeting. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's, it is quite a complicated picture because the GLA has a role as well. And then you also have these um, national and various distribution issues. But I think the, the um, issue today that Farah's really brought out, and I think some of the mutual aid groups brought out strongly as well, was this issue of at the, you know, poverty, but also retaining dignity so that um, you know, it, it, it's, we, we're getting away from any kind of idea of a you know, sort of soup kitchen um, philanthropy. How can we? Um, how can we 
help retain people's dignity whilst also tackling the food poverty issue, which is a challenge. But I mean, Farah, there are some really interesting ideas um, I thought there, um, and uh, a, a, um, a pay as you as you feel shop, um, and and things like that. Giving people back agency, I think, is is quite important and and quite tricky tricky to do um yeah thanks for that Piers um, I don't know if there's anything um any other links uh, or um what I wasn't quite sure was what the next steps were actually of that um food food summit was there a planned um follow-up to that to the summit was that yeah 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 so um there are several key themes which you'd all recognise, and there's something around bringing together a um, an action plan for the borough, and in terms of also linking in, um, we'll have another summit, because there's something for me from a public health perspective, we're in a public health crisis, um, easing out of it, fingers crossed, but who knows what comes back on the horizon. And um, we need to act now, clearly, which we have been doing around the emergency response, um, and it's almost like on a cycle, what, what's the window before we saw how quickly things happen in terms of the response to travellers from Spain. Um, but things can turn around quickly. Obviously, prevalence of COVID is, is low at the moment within the boroughs. Um, but again, cases may rise. So it's kind of thinking around, for me, from a basic level, thinking around the three month rhythm. Um, things may be faster than that, but to bring people together to again reappraise against emerging needs, and then also around what the um, the immediate response has been and next steps. So, on a kind of cycle and seeing where we're heading, really. Great, thank thanks for that. Um, okay, anyone else want to chip in with any thoughts or suggestions? You have to be careful, Effie, for putting your hand above the, the don't scratch your, <laughs> so, um, oh, Laura, Laura, I'll come bring you in. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm from Unity Works. I'm not sure if you know who Unity Works are, um, but we support people with learning disabilities. Um, we used to be part of the Camden Society and we've kind of, um, broken away in the last year to become a sort of more bespoke um, organisation, helping people around community, health, well-being, um, and getting on the road to employment. Um, we run a number of social enterprises, um, which are cafes, a garden centre. Um, we have a cafe in the Greenwood Centre in Kentish Town. Um, and within those cafes, we run apprenticeship programmes and trainee placements for people with learning disabilities. Um, at the moment, our cafe in the Greenwood Centre is closed. Um, but we're looking for any kind of um, things that we can kind of work with other people and help it get it up and running again. Um, it's probably not going to be open to the public for a while, but there is um, a kitchen space there and there's a full kitchen team, um, which would include getting people with learning disabilities back into work as well. Um, we, one of our cafes in Westminster, um, at the start of the lockdown, we worked, um, turned around pretty quickly. We did. Um, about 68,000 meals for homeless people um, that we produce there and um, we, we work with Felix as well getting them out to people um, we did food, food parcels, hot meals in um, sort of um, elderly care homes as well um, so really if there's anything that people need a kitchen or a kitchen team um, please do come and chat to us we've got some um, additional funding that we're applying for to help with other projects as well so um just yeah open really for any collaboration at all please get in touch i'll put my details in the chat box great thank thanks laura and of course many people will remember fondly remember flapjacks which was also a um, camden society project and an interesting one in that it was it did very reasonable um very reasonable cost food but of course was also uh, an employment project giving employment to people with learning disabilities so another model um, and and just speaking of which I just want to briefly mention um, we did invite uh, people supermarket but they weren't able to send anyone along but that's an interesting model as well um, down on Marchmont Street where 
it's it's set up as a, a user co-op um, and uh, you can um, exchange hours of work in the shop for your your sort of membership of the co-op and your discount so that's another interesting model um, and hopefully if I if I find any, if I can get them to write a little bit about how that's going I will um, circulate that around to everyone what's that um, called again Kevin uh, it's the People's Supermarket. It's on Lamb's Conduit Street, um, right opposite um, uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, and it's been going for a while. I mean, they did, there is a, I don't know where if it, they did, there was an old, um, when they started, uh, I think in the noughties, there was a three part documentary about them starting up which I think you can still find on YouTube somewhere. It's, it's quite interesting, but I know it's been, it's not been easy and, and evidently they haven't particularly sort of expanded that model, um, but it does still, it does still exist down on Lambs Conduit Street. Right, any, any other thoughts or contributions or, or, do, or Farah or Alicia, anything you want to come back on um, in the light of, of what's been said? Can I um, say anything that's done in Camden? The, one of the biggest issues is obviously where you do it, how much does it cost? That's, a, that's always one of the big things. I mean, you um, at Volunteer Action Camden, you lead on this, the issue of so people who are service providers like us sort of like community partners in bigger community centers the issue there like what we are able to do what we're not able to do and if camden puts up their prices to the community centers how it gets passed down to the people who pay rent to the community centers like us and i think that is the biggest barrier is that we you know even for us i mean obviously I'll just keep it to myself for now, but some of you know where we're thinking of doing our community fridge and larder. And it is, it, it is one of the biggest issues. It's to be able to find a space that is affordable. And at the moment, one of the things is that a lot of the community centers in Camden have, have, to, have had to adapt to this new model of charging community groups 25 pounds an hour, 40 pounds an hour, um, but in, in, in the same respect, when you put in for a funding application, um, the funding application will say, we want to know that you're a London living waged employer, that you're paying your staff a fair salary. So, you know, th there's this um, difference, isn't there, between you. So you want community organizations to do that, but also where are we meant to go to flourish? And there are spaces available in, in Camden. We all know there are. But the model, you know, maybe now past COVID, maybe this model will change. I have hope, but maybe also um, certain properties that are available maybe will be made available at a right price for community organisations. Um, yeah, just that. I mean, let me dive in and say just by chance, um, Alicia, we are uh, recipients of a co-op foundation grant uh, looking at... Um, a space to connect it's called uh, and obviously things have things have changed completely since covid but but that as farah was alluding to that this is a fundamental problem in in central london that if you're going to charge market or near market rents in in literally the most expensive place on the planet then th there's there's a fundamental difficulty with making community activity happen um, it, it, if it happens in a, in a place where rents are charged, it's going to be expensive. Um, we are sort of halfway through that project and I'll, I'll let Donna say a bit more, um, but it, yes, Donna, over to you. I wasn't you. going to say anything about that. I had a question. Oh, Sue, okay. <laughs> but yes, we are, I mean, we're looking at the COVID situation and that, and this is, I mean, that really resonated with me when, Claire Pritchard talked about everything changed for them when they got an asset, a building of their own that they could generate their own income from. And I just wondered, Sue, if actually changing, you know, or sort of as you're transitioning into this sort of new world we're in, 
with your kitchen model, presumably that's not going to generate income. And you're in this um, with the community center, I guess, having to pay pretty competitive market rents, aren't you? So, I mean, so food projects take up a lot of space as well. So I've just wondered how that sort of worked with your space, really, having to pay huge amounts of rent for a community building. Plus, you know, now having to look at using space for something that isn't really going to generate income. Do you want me to an <clears throat> do you want me to answer on that one? <laughs> <laughs> Can you answer it? That's the I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, in a way, I mean, you know, Farah hit the nail on the head is that uh, we pay 31,700 a year. Uh, for rent in an area that is um, un, it's largely residential um, in the northwest tip of Camden. I often say it's North, Camden's northwest frontier, off forgotten, but a little bit more on the map now. Um, so that is an issue. Ironically, I think one of the issues for us is that some of the spaces where everybody used to crowd into and be really cosy and chatting and laughing, you can't have that now. So we actually have a room that would kind of it used to fit 12 in it cozily um, you can maybe fit three four um, in it now and it what happened is that you know we have to maybe refocus some priorities there may be choices there um, and when the food cycle food bank sort of um, asked us to host their food bank what was a, a room for classes um and groups to meet is is now full of food although i'm not entirely sure of the nutritional value of some of it but it it's food and some of it's quite nice and it was and it, at the weekend it's full of uh, it has lots of vegetables they give out they get loads of vegetable deliveries obviously it's fresh um so we've given out temporarily that room but actually because it actually couldn't really be used for the function it was before and the focus is now largely on our main hall and it's going to be very much a really careful rotoring um, during the day but then obviously there's then issues of cleaning and go you know clean the building rotoring and we actually can't really charge too high rents because there aren't that many groups kind of definitely want to use us at that rate so we are very much for our building asset reliant on the core grant from Camden and that itself is going to be re-looked at in December 20 well during 21 and of course, Camden, like all the other boroughs, are going to be hit. So I think they're, by and large, I would sort of, although I think we criticise them, I think Camden are, you know, do have quite a good partnership and do support their voluntary sector, I have to say, although critical of them sometimes, I do think that Camden, you know, deserve praise where it's due, but they are going to be very challenged. So I know that rent is something that, you know, rent is definitely an issue that might impact on the ability for, for these venues, bearing in mind what was said, um, you know, by, uh, I think it was it Claire, who was saying about physical assets and, yeah. and has been stressed. So yes, it is an issue um, and Camden are looking at the rents and maybe they need to go back to that review because if part of it was all about looking at social value of those buildings, maybe there's a sort of need to relook at it and um, totally a, a little bit more afresh than what they were maybe looking, the model they were presenting for reviewing it and reducing the funding in back in February wasn't really all that much. So that's, yes, that's another, that's another problem looming. But again, it's about reappraisal. Where are the priorities? You know, uh, it, given, given what can be given by the community centres and other community venues that aren't class, you know, actually classed as community centres, it is about looking at the rent issue, but also the other costs um, as well that are going to be mounting up. And I think that, you know, I, for me, it's about poverty alleviation. So you can't then be charging people market rent to about poverty alleviation. So it is choices, choices, but we need to work on them. And I think fairly decisively throughout the next six six to nine months so we know where we're going does that answer your question donna yeah i'm I just yeah i'm I was just interested to yeah about how sort of people are thinking about this but yeah it's good that camden are really looking at that i agree i suppose what was in the back of my mind as well is years ago we we were all looking at the idea of asset transfers and um and i i sort of wonder how much but also the competitive sort of market 
environment isn't appropriate for community buildings in that context so it's um yeah i mean there are a lot of different issues and there are a lot of different things that could be looked at um in terms of how that that is sort of but yeah just the idea of having this sort of really high rent building underpinning a food project seems slightly crazy and you know they don't really go together so um yeah um and I think it's something we're going to be looking at, I, I guess, in terms of how buildings are used and um, through the, the sort of work we were doing pre-COVID, but also which has now sort of expanded a bit into the idea of just the way buildings and spaces are used. Um, so moving away from buildings, if you take spaces during the sort of COVID situation, I'm sure you know anyone who lives in an estate environment all the open spaces for example have been locked through the whole of because they're you know multi-use games areas and their um their uh children's playgrounds so they've been padlocked because those so the open space for people who are already probably living in quite overcrowded conditions has been you know really quite locked down so and people without gardens all that sort of thing so there are issues around spaces but also the way people are looking at buildings now in terms of different uses that are emerging in um from this so yeah i'm just interested in how that sort of adaption particularly to food projects is quite key i think in yeah um uh, just coming back on that something that struck me is that we've actually got um uh we we've got it's a council owned housing we're owned by housing sidings is one of the housing owned buildings um we have a sort of like a car park and then there's a kind of grass muddy bit that everybody parks on anyway and they shouldn't but actually looking at it totally afresh thinking of creating a garden where people can it's not going to be a full community garden but actually the, the mental health issue creating a kind of tranquility space but also maybe where you can grow things like herbs and some kind of food produce because linking into that it's about encouraging that whole permia culture of growing your own and being being resilient um, and through that you know herbs and it's about cookery and learning you know tasting things and making them taste nice and different and all the wonderful herbs that you get from all around the world um, and it, that goes with cookery but it's and it's also somewhere sort of that that encourages that whole um taking care of yourself um so i think it's about a general refocus of culture on that and part of that is how you can then be more in control of what you do and it, even it goes down to doing being able to do things like grow stuff you know you can grow stuff on balconies you can grow something on even on a you know windowsill and and actually realizing that it, it's about to, you know because when you're it's a sort of some theories about when you're out of touch with being able to grow things that that's what takes away your empowerment so it's a bit like um without kind of sounding too fluffy it, you know it's about having that realizing that you can actually have just a, a small impact on your life and then that grows into a bigger impact and a bigger impact so it's all about those kind of stuff and it, it does start with the basics doesn't it it's the it's the food and the warmth and the bit and feeling good about yourself so just a thought but maybe open spaces could be th you know thoughts about always having a community garden if you've got a community space should there always be a bit now given over to a community garden there's always usually a bit of open space where there's a hidden corner that nobody uses it's used for dogs to do whatever why not create it into a community garden and then all of those things that happen from it you create all this wonderful interaction people get together they're one of the best ways for community engagement sorry don't get me on to open spaces because i love the <laughs> but there's so much potential there and it's not used so maybe can yeah, we look at that I agree. yeah absolutely <laughs> that's um uh, kevin, up there. kevin i've got a link to uh, the camden let's oh right mary okay great yeah. so have a look and, in the um, anybody who wants to get in touch there's a contact us we'll put your email in the chat and uh wonderful what you're saying susan and uh are people uh do you know about the permaculture association they're dedicated to teaching people how to grow food um i don't know what uh, what they've got going here but um locally there's think and do they've been doing classes on on the 
I think it's probably white and middle class on the whole. <laughs> but uh, but they're doing, sure. well, they're doing okay. lots of good work. Great. Well, have a look in the chat and look at the links. There's, the, there's links that Mary's put to let's. I've put the link to the survey that Philip Vaughan is doing at the council. There's some other interesting links in there. So thank you all for, for coming. And a big thanks to uh, our speakers, Claire Pritchard, Farrah Rainfly, and Alicia Vaughan. And, and so many issues that came together there um, that we started with a very specific one on food and then it's really opened up to mm. issues of community de mm. development mm. and um, the broader issue of poverty um, and sustainability mm. um, and uh, so many so many things interlinked together there so Thank you all very much for a very stimulating discussion, uh, stimulating speakers. Um, we'll try and capture some of that and put that up on there, our is there, website. By any chance, have you got a couple of minutes to spare? Sorry, I'm away. You can't see me waving. <laughs> oh, Laura, sorry. I just I jump in and just. You. Can you hear me okay? Sorry, my connection's yeah. not the best. Um, I was just sort of wanting to come in on a more practical level, really, in terms of offering solutions where possible, um, sort of picking up upon what Alicia highlighted uh, in terms of challenges going forward, moving away from the delivery model and in sort of in-person collections at food banks. Um, so I'm here, sorry, on behalf of Time to Spare, I'll just spare, elaborate. Yeah. Um, and we've been working with community centres predominantly in Camden and Islington. Um, and it's the main tool that we offer is a monitoring reporting software. Um, so loosely put, just helping charities to collect better data about the beneficiaries that they're engaging, a bit of hard data about the great work that they're doing, the programmes that they offer. Um, yes, but as a side you're, note, you're also doing the um, time to spare the volunteer recruitment in the borough as well. Yeah, so, so the pandemic has kind of pulled us in lots of different directions, really. Um, so secondary to that being the volunteering platform and also I was just going to mention um, the track and trace tool that we've developed. We've been working alongside Kentish Town Community Centre uh, with Sarah there who's lovely and their food bank initiative sprang out of the you know out of the Covid pandemic with their happiness hamper initiative um, and we're sort of trying to develop a track and trace tool for them not only sort of for NHS requirements and you know complying with GDPR uh, I suppose stipulations but also anybody that's using that then using the food bank is also then signed up to their membership scheme um, and they're collecting data on their food bank users so I suppose that's also feeding into a demonstrating social value but b I suppose really kind of keeping track of and confirming what you think you know about your target users if that makes sense but looking at what other people have picked up on as engaging you know the right part of the community um, and I think they were quite concerned that it was obviously erected as an emergency provision and making sure that people are just coming hopefully as a one-off but um, but yeah so if we're just basically keen to collaborate and if anybody's interested or has concerns about you know in-person contact detail collection uh, when okay. Thanks, Laura. I mean, and if you send me the links to those, um, I wasn't aware of the um, the track and trace work that you were doing with Kentish Town Community Centre. But yeah, send the links and we will put those up on the forum page um, with all the other links that we've got from today. Um, and then we'll let everyone know once that once that is up, hopefully by the end of the week. So I'm going to draw things to a close there. We're a couple of minutes over time. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, and look forward to seeing you all at a future forum.